and, and clubs, we had a huge ecological impact. I mean, with spears and clubs, we extinguished a lot of the slow-moving big animals and we overexploited them and drove them to extinction and then we'd have to move. And the people left behind would have to say, holy cow, you know, there, are, there aren't any more mammoths here. There aren't any more uh, uh, marsupial lions or, or giant elks or giant sloths. We wiped those out with very primitive uh, technology. But the people that were left behind as the others moved on for more resources had to find a way of living in balance with what was left. And that, over thousands of years, became indigenous knowledge. It was the knowledge indigenous people had was hard-won knowledge because they made all the same mistakes that we're making today when they came in, you know. Oh, wow, you know, there's a mole bird. They're 10 feet tall and they're so, they can't fly. I've got a club pound the hell out of them and drive them to extinction. I mean, we've done that since Paleolithic times. So what we've got then is the accumulation of knowledge of the people that stayed behind. They gave us a, a way of living in balance with, with what was left. Now, cut ahead to the present time. My grandparents emigrated to Canada in 1905 from Japan. Their children my dad and mom. My dad was born in Vancouver in 1909. My mom in 1911. They grew up with a generation of Japanese Canadian kids that had no grandparents and no elders. They were all over in Japan. All they had were their moms and dads who were in their 30s, 20s and 30s, to tell them about Japan or, or whatever. But they had no roots in the land that they grew up, they were born in. Now you think about that, since the great wave of exploration and occupation over the past 500 years, waves of immigrants have come into Africa, come into South America, into Australia, into New Zealand, and it was the same thing. The children of the first colonizers had no elders or grandparents. They had no roots in place. And what does that mean then? It means as you find a place in these new lands, you don't have the same attitude to land that the indigenous people have. You look at it as real estate, as a commodity or an opportunity. So we buy it, we move on to it, we exploit whatever is there, we develop it, we sell it, and we move away. That's why I believe the indigenous people now are leading the major battles because they got something we don't have. They've got that hard-won, long indigenous knowledge. So, you know, in the past, environmental groups have exploited First Nations. You know, in BC, I, I've seen it happen over and over again. We want to fight to save this forest. Oh, hey, that, that forest, uh, I think those, uh, that native band has a claim on there. Let's get them involved. And then we use the natives then to, to fight to save that area. But without really understanding why they are critical to the movement to save that forest. So I think one of the, the first words I learned as my wife and I began to, to work with uh, indigenous communities over 35 years ago now, first word we learned from them was respect. You're not going to learn a damn thing if you don't have respect. You have to respect the people. And I think for those of us that are concerned about the implications of fracking and climate change, we now have to go and, and form partnerships and with, with First Nations because they have that deep one sense that we can, acquire, uh, we can acquire from them. First, we go with respect. Thank you. Thank you for preserving that connection. And thank you still for being willing to share it. I just want to thank Dr. Suzuki, and perhaps uh, we could have you come back in the spring and continue this conversation. <laughs> we are coming back in September. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I don't know, did you want to add something else, and then we'll have to no, take one. I just wanted to say that uh, uh, all the species in the world are still following the original instructions, except 
to human beings. <laughs> I just want to make one, one quick comment here. You know, when you look at the film, uh, you know, indigenous communities, as we're talking about here today, are connected in a way that that, that, that most people are not, and, and, and it's clear here from what you've seen today that, that there's a special connection. But as uh, the Chief said, this isn't just a Native issue, it's a New Brunswick issue. And when you start to look at some of these communities, and you look at the communities in the film, those farmers, those hunters, those fishers that are non-Indigenous, they still are also really connected in an important way that brings us together. And that's something that we really need to consider, because many of these people are also tied to the land. It's not as, as deep and as long term, but that's an important connection that brings people together, that, that, that has people looking at climate change in a similar kind of way, through that observational knowledge, through that place, through that connection. And when you start to look at industrial development issues, that's another place where people are worried about water. They understand these things. And so I, I think there's a, an intimate connection across the different communities. And the film says that about climate change, but it could easily be said about all the other issues that we're talking about here today. And I think that's an important thing that, that speaks across Atlantic Canada, not just to, in New Brunswick, but, but across the region. And, and that's a hopeful thing for us to get on it with a different paradigm, as, that as David said. That another question, if I could say that we have a problem across this country. The average child today in Canada spends eight minutes a day outside <laughs> and over six hours a day in front of a computer, television, or iPhone screen. So the big challenge for us who care about where we're going is tell the kids to turn the damn things off and get outside. Question, and then we're going to have to wrap things up, so please, if you'd like to ask a question. Hi, my name is Ryan, and I've just been involved in the uh, shale gas resistance uh, here for several months now. Spent some time in Elsa Buktuk in the area helping out best I can. Now I'm doing a lot of work through social media. Um, recently, uh, the trend has been moving towards uh, propaganda, uh, labeling many activists as eco terrorists. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of this is, is occurring. Uh, it's going to occur more and more. I see a trend happening. I know you've been in the game for a while. I just, uh, Mr. Suzuki, I'd like to know um, if you have any inspiring stories or any experiences or any comments on how to counteract that propaganda machine um, and to, you know, maintain faith going forward in, in, you know, when we are so heavily monitored via social network. Um, when we're when we're out in public, um, more and more. Well, I don't. I, I I really have faith in in the public. I mean, if you look at uh, what's going on with Enbridge and the Northern Gateway, the pipeline from the tar sands to uh, to uh, Kidmat or wherever they wanted to come out, they have been putting out just commercial after commercial after commercial on television. Nobody buys it. Nobody buys it. I mean, the the the. People know that, uh, well, I think they just know the vast majority of British Columbians don't want that pipeline, and the companies don't have that much uh, credibility. Well, I, I just, I see, I don't see people getting it because we, we're currently in a situation right now where we have uh, the provincial government and our federal government sitting uh, idly by um, essentially allowing an American corporation um, to exercise See, we've, insane human rights violations. We've had seven or eight years now of the Harper government. I have never seen such a, a, a government so hostile to the environmental movement. It's absolutely deliberate. I mean, it, it's clear. Harper himself doesn't say anything. Have you ever heard him say a word about climate change? Even to say the word, right? No. It's like it doesn't exist, but what he does is send out his minions, like Peter Kent and uh, Joel Oliver, and, and you know, to say, well, they lump environmentalists as eco-terrorists, as uh, uh, extremists, and they lump us, they will actually mention environmentalists and the Taliban in the same run of, of their effort. So, you know, in my, I do have moments in which I, 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 wonder, I get paranoid and think, no, 
the Harper government is all about law and order, and we know that crime rates are going down, but he wants to expand the prisons. Jesus, are they going to fill them with eco-terrorists? <laughs> anyway, I don't let myself get into that too much. But, you know, we do have, we have a political system that is so dysfunctional. You know, my mother and father were born and raised in Canada all their lives. They couldn't vote until after World War II because they were Asians. Asians and black people and, and native Canadians were not allowed to vote until way after World War II. So I take the right to vote very, very uh, seriously. I voted in every election after I turned 21, in every federal election. But I have never voted for a party that ever got into office. So my vote has been wasted. And we have governments like the Mulroney government, the Harper government, that get in with 40% of the vote. We've got a very bad system. So, uh, you know, democracy is, is hard to get. And we've got, I, I personally think we've got to correct that. We've got to have a system of proportional representation. But our guts out with what we've got and look at the progressive elements and uh, and ensure that that whatever government gets in represents the progressive forces in this in this country and that's going to be a real challenge <laughs> well, as, as of yet the only I'm, sorry, the, I'm gonna have to cut you on I'm, I'm ending on this as of yet the only um, culture that in the face of the earth that has ever shown true democracy has been indigenous peoples. so until we actually um, start listening to them more and, and implementing strategies and have them to be our, essentially our leaders. I don't believe that now our current system... don't give them a swelled head, you know? <laughs> it's, it's, I, I, this, man, this man is extremely humble. This man is extremely <laughs> humble and he's already, his head's already physically huge, so don't worry about it. <laughs> but his heart's bigger. Alright. Okay, well, I'd like... Woo! One more, one more. One more.